Baruchot and welcome to another edition of our Torah classes. And whether you're logging on to the incredible site of Torah for Women, ohelsara.com, or the amazing global network of Torah, Torah Anytime, or if you're a YouTube subscriber and you follow, thank you so much for your devotion to Torah and to your neshama. Dosh Baruch should continue to instill in you a fervor and a yearning to continue to want to learn His Torah. Hashem Yivarech Otchem, Hashem should bless you, Vimalet kol mishalot libchem letova ulivracha. And He should grant your request, whatever request that may be, He should grant it for the good and with tremendous blessings. We have a lot of work to do today, so please answer Amen to the following. For the Zivugagun, for the soulmate, that she should find her soulmate, Galit Yambat Gavriela. Kadosh Baruch Hu should grant her her Hatan very soon. We should hear good news that she's getting married and also for a blessing on her new acupuncture business. The Baruch Hashem, Kadosh Baruch Hu should be able to help her, that all those who come through her door should be able to heal them through Hashem. Please answer amen to the speedy recovery of Dalia Batalis, that 65-year-old woman who was diagnosed with uh, cancer and she's in the progressing stages. Shem should grant her a shlema. The refua shlema of Yaakov Yishai ben Naami. For the refua shlema of Yohanna Wankmuller. And the refua shlema of my dear precious student in Florida, Chaya Rachel Bat Sarah. Please, Hashem should grant her always health and success in everything that she does. Le'ilui nishmat, for the elevation of the soul of Yutul Bat Yechien. Sad news of a 10-year-old girl uh, in Brooklyn who passed away. Such sad news. Hashem should grant the entire family tremendous comfort. Nechama, we shall only see Yeshuot from this. Allah shalom, Yutul Bat Yechiel. Kadosh Baruch should just bring us all Yeshuot because when we hear such tragic news like this, there, there are no words, there are simply no words. For the Ilui Neshama of Osvaldo Lurero, Alam Shalom. For the Ilui Neshama, the elevation of the soul of Rachamim Ben Daniel, and Alava Shalom, and also to every brave soldier in Eretz Yisrael that fell defending the land, this holy land that Hashem promised to us that would be flowing with milk and honey. For the health, the success, and parnasa, sustenance, bracha, blessings, and closeness to Hashem, Ruth and Jordan McDonald, as well as Marie Elizabeth, to Javier Jayapal's wife and children should be blessed, blessed with health, success, blessings, closeness to God and all the good. And also to Sage, Rain and Mila for their spiritual success and closeness to Hashem. Also for the success and protection of all of our Chayalim, precious Chayalim, our precious soldiers who are out on the battlefield, making sure that we can sleep soundly at night with Hashem's help, of course, and all those who are abducted by this terrible, evil regime of Hamas. We, we are longing for a Pesach miracle. And, uh, you know, there was a rabbit, and I don't know who, what her name is, who asked us all to go through the list of hostages that are left in Aza, wherever they may be, and we should leave an empty space for them, empty seat for them at our Seder table as a, as a show of support and love for them that we wish Hashem will bring them back to us soon. And that's what we plan to do at our Seder as well. I hope you'll do the same. Uh, I want to thank all those who have been donating to Torah hours and in general to help needy families, to the mikvah and everything that we need here at Ohel Sara. You have no clue the happiness that you are bringing to families, the happiness that you bring to my heart and my soul whenever I open up the computer and I see that someone donated to help a needy family, to help our local mikvah, to, to, to 
to make Hashem happy with the Torah hours that you are sponsoring. That makes me the happiest, really, to be honest with you, because we're spreading so much good in the world. So thank you for Torah hours to Alicia Lassain, Ariel Ifrach, Migrit Lurero, Kurt Schellenbach, 300 hours of Torah, Galit Alter Buchbinder, 500 hours of Torah, Ramin Akavan, 1,000 hours of Torah. Also, thank you to all those who have been sending donations via mail to our Brooklyn address. Thank you to, um, whether to our Brooklyn address or through our, the site, but didn't have an email. Thank you to Amy Sharfman. Thank you so very much and for your beautiful dedication. And to Edith Chaimov, you're so sweet. I love you. Also, I have to make a special mention and a special thank you to Johannes and Devorah van der Heiden, to Ashley Volmar, and to Jonas Isaac Haley for the incredibly generous donations that they made recently to needy families. Because of you, we have enough money now to support all those needy families the second days of the Chag, the second days of the holidays. Thank you so, so very much. Also, there was a beautiful dedication from Ashley Volmar. Listen to what she wrote after she made her donation. This is for the daughters of Hashem who thrive in the fold of Ohel Sarah, who persevere in spite of their challenges. May Eliyahu Navi Zachor Latov be at your door. Such a beautiful, beautiful dedication. Ashley, thank you so very much. You brought tears to my eyes when I read this, and may it be so that when we open the door to Eliyahu Navi on the night of the Sedo, he should be standing there waiting to redeem us. I also want to make a special mention of an Ilui Neshama, the elevation of the soul of a very, very special student of mine, Yehudit Bat Sarah Alea Shalom, who tragically passed away from uh, an illness last year, uh, this time. It was today, actually, uh, that last year we had to bury her here in Bet Shemesh. It was one of the most challenging situations for me, very difficult to go through that and to see it and to be involved in it, but it's, uh, it's such a mitzvah. And so we grant the family of Yehudit Batsara Lea Shalom, I hope they are, are comforted knowing that she's a righteous woman who's in Shamaim, hopefully praying for all of us to be redeemed. Yehudit was a special, special woman Tremendous tzniyot, such modesty and grace and kindness. She was so kind and always giving and always wanting to know what more she could do, how much she could give, how she could help. Hashem should raise her soul mala mala from one level in the Shemaim to the next to find her final resting place as this is her first yard site. So I want to dedicate this shi'u to Yehudit Bat Sarah and also to say that this shi'u was sponsored by my precious student Melissa Spruel and her husband Justin and also partially sponsored by Teresa McDonald so I actually want to dedicate it to the, the, these for two reasons number one for Yehudit Bat Sarah as I mentioned Alea Shalom and for the two precious twins who were born to Melissa and Justin Spruel just about a week and a half ago, close to two weeks ago, Mikhaya Sage Ben Melissa and Akiva Sheraton Ben Melissa. May they have a speedy recovery because they're preemies. They should come home safely and healthy from the hospital. May they feel close to Hashem always, learning Torah, obeying His commandments with love and with happiness. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu grace them with the physical and spiritual protection, with sustenance, with prosperity, with all the good in the world. And Bezat Hashem, they should grow up to have a successful conversion. So this shiur was dedicated to these twins of Justin and Melissa Spruel who sponsored the shiur and also for the Ilui Neshama of Yehudit Bat Sarah Alea HaShalom. I also want to say that it's never too late just because tomorrow night is Pesach 
of donating to needy families. And I'll explain to you why I'm telling you that. And also to the sponsorship of Torah. I want to talk to you about what's going to be happening on uh, Thursday morning, Be'ezat Hashem. We will be... Well, let me speak first about the donations to needy families. Baruch Hashem, as a result of all of your donations, we were able to help so many families here in Eretz Yisrael maintain and observe their Chag the first days with grace and with honor and mechubad, that they should have everything that they need. Baruch Hashem. Many of them have been writing to us about how how joyous they were. Some of them cried to us about how they didn't know how they were going to make it. Uh, one woman especially, a divorced woman with five children, didn't know how she was going to make this Chag. And Baruch Hashem, we were able to give her on a number of occasions uh, for her to finally be able to buy all the food that she needs um, and everything that's required for the Pesach holiday. And Baruch Hashem, thanks to some of you who donated so generously this past week, now we have a little bit put aside also for the second days. But I want to explain something to you. In Israel, we only hold, Pes uh, we only hold the holiday of one day. In the Galut, you have two days of a Chag. We only have one day. So technically, tomorrow night begins our Chag. And Tuesday night, the, Chag, the first days of the Chag are officially over and we now enter into the period called Chol HaMoed. It's the intermediary days between the first days of Pesach and the last days of Pesach. Many people, they do fun things during the Chag. They take their, maybe their children on a picnic, they have a barbecue, they go out a little bit, they have a few days that they can spend with the family. Some of these people don't have money for those days because they have the money for the first days and Bezat Hashem we're going to be sending them the money for the second days but they don't even have money to take their kids out anywhere to enjoy the Chag a little bit to maybe buy them something so I, I would like it if possible if you want to send money and you, and you, if you have an option in the memo even if you choose Kimcha de Pischa if you want to donate specifically for the intermediary days, please write it in the memo. This way, I can actually make those families happy and say, by the way, here's an extra $100 or $200, whatever it is, for the intermediary days. Go take your family out, do something, buy the kids a toy, I don't know what, but something to bring them a little happiness. Please, if you're going to give for Kimcha de Pischa, and you specifically want to help these families during the intermediary days, please indicate that on the memo. Otherwise, when the money comes in only for Kimcha de Pischa, which is helping needy families, I will assume that it's only for the second days of the Chag, which is the last days, uh, meaning to help them with the holiday, the, the final holiday days. Okay, and I want to thank you again for your dedication and your support. Hashem should just bless you all with all the good in the world but especially with health and a special, special protection. Shem should give you shmira meyuchedet. Not a hair on your head should be harmed, should be touched. Hashem should watch over you with special angels that you are creating with all of the mitzvot and all the chasadim, all the kindnesses that you're involved in. And may you see Hashem's hand guiding you through every, every aspect of life. Okay, one more announcement and then we begin. Thursday morning Eastern Standard Time, going to be about 10 o'clock in the morning, which is 5 p.m. Israel time. I am going to be making a Zoom, live Zoom special conference for all those who want to join called Let's Talk. Let's talk means there are so many, of you, so many of you out there who have questions. So many of you out there who want reassurance and inspiration. And you want to, know, want to learn even more about the Chag. So I'm creating a special forum. It's a live Zoom class where you can actually log on and I'll be there. 
You'll be able to ask your questions, make your comments. You'll be able to hear what I have to say, learn a little bit more about this Chag from me. Uh, this will take place again on Thursday morning, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. Uh, Israel Time. We, if you would like to join, please contact me at info, I-N-F-O, at ohelsara.com, O-H-E-L-S-A-R-A.com. Please put in the email that you'd like to join. Um, uh, it just costs eighteen dollars, and the eighteen dollars goes to obviously to it's a charitable donation. Let me know that you're interested, and then I will send you the instructions, as well as how to join. So I hope you'll all join me. It's so important for us to come together on that day and to talk talk about some of the things that are happening in the world, to talk about your position of life, to answer some of the questions that are on your minds and in your hearts, and to get clear answers, as well as to feel emotional and spiritual support from the entire group. So please, if you're interested, contact us at info at ohelsara.com, email us, let us know that you're interested, and we'll send you all the information needed to join that Thursday morning forum. Tomorrow night, we will be celebrating Chag Pesach, the holiday that commemorates the exodus from Egypt and all the incredible miracles that Hashem created for us in order to save us from the Egyptian exile. Pao, who was defeated by God through the plagues that his country with, was struck with, finally decided to free the Jews. But after we left, he changed his mind, if you could believe that. And in a bold and daring attempt, he and his army, whatever was left of Egypt, chased after the Jews in the desert. We all know the story. The Jews were trapped between the sea and Paro's army. And we're very familiar with the miracle of the splitting of the sea and how the Jews crossed a divided ocean, making it safely to the other side while their enemies drowned in those very waters. You know, in these turbulent times amid Am Yisrael, where we're once again facing the identical situation, and our enemies have engulfed us and we're surrounded on all sides, we can certainly use a miracle like Kriyat Yamsuf, like the splitting of the sea that would then lead us to the final redemption. And may it be soon. Now, when the Jews came out of Mitzrayim, they thought that the slavery, that the oppression and the torture was finally over. They thought they'd never have to see Pao or any Egyptian ever again. After all, HaKadosh Baruch Hu struck Egypt with plagues that the world had never seen, and he crushed the Egyptian, the Egyptian empire, pulverizing it, leaving very little in its wake. Pao took a massive beating from Hashem for being stubborn, for his defiance and his brazen attempt to do battle against God himself. So in the middle of the night, during the final Makkah of Bechorot, when all the firstborn Egyptian males were being wiped out, Paro finally broke and sent us out of Egypt. He was running around Egypt in his pajamas, looking for Moshe Rabbeinu alav shalom, screaming, get out! and take your people with you. I don't ever want to see you again. That night was the night that we left Egypt, assuming we'd never see Paro again. We thought, that's it, ding dong, the witch is dead, the witch is dead, the witch is dead, you know? And we are now free men. We were so happy to finally leave Egypt. We were so happy that the slavery had come to an end and that Paro was now behind us as we move forward into a new world of redemption. 
We thought we'd never have to worry about the Egyptian threat ever again. And just when we thought that the torture of Egypt was over, just as we settled into the mindset that we are no longer going to have to wake up to a day of bondage, we arrived at the Yamsuf, at the Red Sea, and what happened? We began to hear a thunderous sound. And as we looked back to see where the noise was emanating from, we couldn't believe our eyes because right there was Paro all over again. So do you know what the episode of Kriyat Yamsuf represents? The splitting of the sea represents that part of the story of Egypt where we were wondering what comes next, what's, what's going to be? I mean, just when we thought that we managed to escape the clutches of the evil Paro and we were finally in the clear, in those moments of relief when we assumed the problems of our former life had come to a permanent halt, just as we hailed a sigh of relief and we said Baruch Hashem we were redeemed from Egypt and that Hashem took us out of the worst place on earth just then we realized that another dilemma was right behind us that's actually the final segment of Pesach by the way that we'll be celebrating called Shvi'i Shel Pesach the seventh and final day of Pesach which is when the miracle of the splitting of the sea occurred so Kriyat Yamsuf represents the idea of Am Yisrael assuming that they were out of the woods out of danger and in a safe space and they wanted to know what's going to happen next what, what did Hashem have planned for them now and suddenly, as they're thinking this, the predicament appears again when they least expected it. My dear friends and students, Am Yisrael, our nation, just recently, was in the midst of an extremely dangerous and intense crisis on October the 7th. Thousands of our brothers and sisters were murdered in the most brutal and, vish and vicious attack by our sworn enemy. Hundreds were taken into captivity and are still prisoners of this evil regime. We entered into battle with Hamas as rockets rained over Eretz Yisrael for weeks. And then things began to die down because Hamas's position weakened and we started to leave our homes feeling a lot more confident and secure and as the Israeli army continued their work it seemed as if the situation was becoming a little less intense as though we were actually making headway and we thought oh, perhaps we're finally going to be freed from Egypt so to speak and we were all wondering but what's going to be? What's going to be? And then we were suddenly hit with 300 ballistic missiles, rockets, and drones that froze the entire country last week, sending us all running to our shelters in the middle of the night. So Kriyat Yamsuf, the splitting of the sea represents the question of, uh, question of what's coming next? What is coming next? The truth is that we really don't know. Only Hashem knows. But what we do know is that the episode and the concept of Kriyat Yamsuf demands a certain attitude from a Jew. That no matter what happens next, we are going to be spiritually and emotionally prepared. And that's what I would like to speak to you about today. The Gemara of Megillah informs us that when Esther Malka Alea Shalom came before Achashverosh unsummoned and she found favor in the eyes of the king, she requested that he and his most trusted advisor Haman attend her private 
banquet that she had prepared. And the Gemara asks, why would Esther invite her man of all people to this private banquet? I mean, what was she thinking? And the Gemara provides us with many explanations. For example, Rabbi Eliezer Alava Shalom said that Esther was laying a trap for Haman. His presence at the banquet might have given him the opportunity to say or do something that he shouldn't say or do, which would then give Ahasuerus the prerogative to execute him. Rabbi Yehuda Alava Shalom said that Esther invited Haman so that he wouldn't suspect her of being Jewish. Rav Nechemia Alav Shalom said that Esther invited Haman in order for the Jews not to become complacent from their prayers and their repentance by feeling secure that they have a sister in the palace who's just going to save them from this genocidal decree. We spoke about that during our Purim sessions. Rabbi Yossi Alav Shalom said that Esther invited Haman so that she could keep her enemies close and manipulate Haman's behavior to the benefit of Am Yisrael. The point is that the Gemara provides us with numerous explanations as to why Esther would think to invite Haman to her private banquet. And we're happy that the Gemara offers us all these opinions. But the question is, which one of these opinions is the correct answer? Says the Gemara, they're all true. All these thoughts entered into the mind of Esther. And all the various calculations that she made is what finally made her decide to invite Haman to this private banquet of hers. In Torah, we have what's called Shiv'im Panim La Torah. There are 70 different facets of Torah, which means there are many different commentaries and explanations and opinions that are given on various psukim, on the verses, or an episode. And Hashem sees to it that all those de'ot, all those opinions and interpretations do indeed come to life, as we see, with the example of Esther. Each one of the Rabbanim's explanations of why Esther would have wanted to invite Haman, they, they were true. Well, how could they all be true? Because it's just merely a different angle of looking at things when you're viewing the episode as a circle. What does that mean? You see, when it concerns a circle, we know that the distance between the outer wall of the circle to the center point of the circle is equal in measure no matter where you're going to measure the, the distance. Which means no matter which point in the outer circle you're at, whether it's the top, to the left, to the right, here, center, doesn't matter where you are at the outer circle, the distance from that point on the outside of the circle to the center of the circle is going to be equal no matter which side you're coming from. The only difference is what angle you're coming from on the circle. But all sides are congruent. They're all equal. The same is true concerning the learning of Torah. All of the opinions of our Rabbanim are correct. They're just viewing the Pasuk, they're just seeing the verse or the episode from a different angle. And because they're viewing it from another angle, their, their opinion, their answer is going to differ from their Torah colleagues. For example, uh, when it concerns Gog u Magog, there's a big question that was asked by the earlier Rabbanim. The question was, is Gog u Magog a full-fledged war or not? Interestingly, the Nitziv Alava Shalom wrote that based on all the Torah literature that he read regarding the subject of Gog u Magog, he hasn't seen anything that indicates a world war. Instead, he concluded that Gog, or Magog, is actually a Magifa. It's a huge plague that descends upon the entire world, 
bringing death to many people and shuts down the entire world everywhere. Well, by the way, that could have been the coronavirus. Now, do all the Rabbanim agree with the Holy Nitziv? No, they don't. The majority were not in agreement with him, like the Hafez Chaim, alav shalom, who strongly disagreed, disagreed with the Nitziv. It's known that the Hafez Chaim revealed to his former student, Rav Elchanan Wasserman, alav shalom, Hashem imkom damo, that the war of Gog and Magog will take place in three stages, three world wars, according to the Hafez Chaim and all, many other Rabbanim. But the Hafez Chaim said that war number one would last approximately four to five years, with a short break prior to the second world war, which will also last a few years, but with millions of casualties. Then he said there's going to be a long pause between the Second World War and the third and final battle of Gog or Magog. And the final third war, he said, will only last between 30 seconds to three minutes. That's it. Some Chachamim said it will last up to 12 minutes. But the point is, it's a very short war. Now the Hafez Chaim lived in the early 1900s, so his words were wondrous and they're filled with divine inspiration. At that time, during the era of the Hafez Chaim, if people would have heard that a war is going to last for three minutes, they would never understand how that's even possible. But today, we know that obviously the Hafez Chaim was referring to a nuclear war. In the atomic radial war, a world that we live in today, we understand what kind of war that would look like. So it was made very clear by the Hafez Chaim that Gog or Magog is indeed a war, like the majority of the Rabbanim spoke about. Uh, they spoke about that horrific war, and they were all in agreement that it will be a world war, according to all the words of our Nevi'im, of our prophets. And they actually, when they used to speak about this subject, they always referred to that war as Milchemet Gogumagog, the war of Gogumagog. So uh, thus far, World War I did indeed take place, and it lasted for four to five years, just as the Hafez Chaim said it would. Then there was a short pause between World War I and World War II, which also lasted for a period of about five or six years, just as the Hafez Chaim said it would, and millions of casualties, as he cited. And there has been a long break from World War II to our current day. So this will be the final round. But as we see, we have a difference of opinion. The Nitziv states that Gog and Magog is a worldwide plague where many will die and the entire world will come to a halt. The Hafez Chaim, however, and other Rabbanim state that Gog and Magog is actually a global war of epic proportions. But what did we just learn from the Gemara of Megillah earlier? Do you remember? we learned that there could be several different opinions between the Rabbanim, but Hashem makes certain that all the opinions come true. So in the case of the Holy Nitziv, who held that Gog or Magog is a Magefa, it's a world-affecting plague, his words did come to life with the COVID virus that struck the entire world and killed millions. But what that means is that it's only one part of the circle that we spoke about. That part has come to pass, but so will the words of the other Rabbanim. As long as there's another de'a, as long as there's another opinion by a leading holy rabbi, that too must come to pass and be justified. We have to remember that God is the one who's running the show from beginning to end. 
And our task is to have faith on the level of the Jews standing at the foot of Har Sinai when they declared, Na'asev and Ishma, we will do and we will hear. We also have to follow Hashem's lead. The point is that at this very moment in our current day, we are at the brink of what seems to be a very fragile political situation that at any moment can become volatile and dangerous, not only for Eretz Yisrael, but the entire world. What happens next can trigger a war that will involve many nations and affect not only the people of Eretz Yisrael but all those living abroad especially those in the United States the land of Edom Hashem should just keep us all safe and protected say Amen but the one thing that everyone seems to be asking these days is what's gonna be? what's gonna be? what's, what's coming next? My dear friends and students, the attitude of the Jew in this current Galut and the place to turn to for the answer to this question is the episode of the Yamsuf and what occurred in those moments right before the sea split. When Am Yisrael left Egypt, they thought their difficulties were over. They thought they'd never see Pao or experience any kind of Jewish persecution ever again. They assumed that the enemy had finally been defeated and they wouldn't ever have to deal with anti-Semitism or oppression. They thought they were now truly free. So they left Egypt celebrating and they were joyful because they felt that they had already lived through the worst horrors imaginable and that they were redeemed from those horrors to now live a free and happy existence. They also knew that their life in Egypt all those years left behind a multitude of Jewish casualties. Living in the Galut, not everybody survives, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, Pao killed thousands upon thousands of babies. Many Jewish men and women died from the back-breaking labor of the slavery. And sadly, four-fifths of the Jews in Egypt perished in Makat Choshech because they didn't have enough faith in the Geula and they wanted to remain in Egypt, in the Galut. Millions of our people died in Egypt prior to the Geula from Egypt. We paid a high price for remaining in the Galut. But at the same time, whoever God spared during the plague of darkness was happy to have made it out of there. So at that point in history, the Jewish people really believed that now that they were redeemed from this horrific galut, they were good to go. And just then, when they thought that it was all over and that they'd never see the ugly face of anti-Semitism rising again, just when they thought that they'd never have to face Pao or experience his evil, they suddenly found themselves faced with another serious danger. They were now in the fatal position of the raging sea in front of them and the Egyptian chariots right behind them ready to trample all of them. And the Jews began to panic. They didn't know what to do. They turned to each other wondering, what's going to be? What's going to be? That's the episode of Kriyat Yamsuf. The splitting of the sea was the answer to the question of what's going to be over here? What's coming next? And here we are, thousands of years later, in Eretz Yisrael, Baruch Hashem, saved from what could have been a major catastrophe. God prevented those 300 plus missiles from touching down and not a single person died. 
But people here and across the world are still asking each other, what's going to be? Now, the natural reaction to the question of what's going to be in such a situation that we're in is generally fear. When we're dealing with the unknown, the first impulse is to feel panic and tension. And that was the reaction of the Jews at the Yam Suf. They all responded with great anxiety and they complained to Moshe Rabbeinu saying, are there no graves in Egypt? That you had to take us out into the wilderness to die over here? What have you done to us? That you took us out of Egypt. Imagine that. The anxiety caused them to speak with such a defiance and with a lack of appreciation and gratitude. They actually felt that being taken out of the exile was one big mistake that might now cost them their life. The people were panic-stricken. All they saw in that moment was the ocean in front of them and Pao's army chasing them from behind and they all thought, that's it, that's it, we're done, we're finished. Just when we thought we were finally safe and out of harm's way, just when we thought the problems of Egypt were over, we have to contend now with an even bigger dilemma. What's going to be? In the moment of the unknown, people start to feel frightened and unsure. But what did HaKadosh Baruch Hu tell Moshe Rabbeinu as Moshe turned to him in prayer? Sefer Shemot. Shem says to him, Mati elai. Why do you cry out to me in this moment? Daber el bene Israel vayisau. Speak to the children of Israel and let them move forward. God tells Moshe Rabbeinu, now is not the time for prayer and supplication. Speak to the Jewish people and tell them to march forward. It's time for action. If you think about it, that's unbelievable. What did Hashem mean by telling Moshe that now was not the time to pray? I mean, since when do you tell the Jewish nation that prayers are not what's needed now? Am Yisrael is famous for their prayers. The concept of tefillah is something that's part and parcel of being a Jew. It's part of our faith. Jews are always praying, even when they find themselves in a very safe and secure position of life. But here HaKadosh Baruch was telling Moshe, the shuls are officially closed, Moshe. Coming together to, play, to pray publicly in a quorum is not an option now. Mati why are you turning to me in prayer? That's what happened, by the way, during the coronavirus. The synagogues were closed and people were, pray were praying alone in their homes. HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Moshe that now was the time to actually go, to take action and march forward with great faith. And we find ourselves again in the same situation, just 24 hours before the Holy Chag of Pesach. No one knows what tomorrow will bring and the question is, What's going to get us through everything that's about to happen next? The answer is complete and unwavering trust in Hashem. That's how you get through everything that's about to happen next. Moshe Rabbeinu turns to the people and he says, Al tirau, do not be afraid. Stand firm and see at Yeshuat Hashem Asher Ayom. See the salvation of God that He's going to do for you today. Moshe told Am Yisrael then, and his words echo throughout the generations, and they should penetrate our hearts now, because he says. Strengthen yourselves. Have faith in Hashem and you'll see His miraculous salvation. My dear friends, according to the level of emunah and bitachon that we have in Hashem, 
And if that faith and trust is such that we rely only on Hashem, that's going to be how much of a Yeshua, how much of a salvation will merit to experience. That's the advice for a spiritual success during a time where we're in one kind of crisis and survived it, and then we're hit with a more dangerous predicament after that. This is the counsel that the Chachamim offer us when we're wondering what's going to happen next, what's going to be. The answer to this question lies in the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph and Bet. We must gird ourselves with emunah and bitachon, with faith and trust only in Hashem and no one and nothing else. That's the Aleph Bet. That's the core and foundation of Yahadut. We have to rely on the Av, on the Father who has seen us through every calamity in the past, and He will be there for us in the present, just as He was for our, for our ancestors at the Yamsuf, at the sea. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one who was then, is now, and will always be the one in control of the events of history. He's the only one who can protect us, shield us, and save us. That's the true story of Kriyat Yamsuf, of the episode of the splitting of the sea. The Gera Rebbe, Alava Shalom, once wondered, why is the episode at the sea referred to as Kriyat Yamsuf? A Kriya is a tearing, like when you tear something apart, Likroa. The Rebbe said that this episode should have not been called Kriyat Yamsuf, the tearing of the sea. Rather, it should have been called Bekiyat Yamsuf, the splitting and or the ripping of the sea. And he points out, he points out that actually in the tefillah, in the prayer of Emet Ve'emuna, the language used when discussing the splitting of the sea is the following. We say, Bokea Yam Lifne Moshe. God split the sea before Moshe. Not only that, he says, but in the Pasuk itself, in Sefer Shemot concerning the splitting of the sea, it states, listen to the words, Vayasem etayam lecharava, and God made the sea into dry land so that the Jews would be able to cross uh, safely with their wagons and their cattle. Vayivaku hamaim, and the waters split. Clearly, says the Gera Rebbe, the Lashon, the language used over here, in many instances is Livkoa, Bekia, Vayivaku, Bokeya, etc., etc. And yet, we don't refer to the splitting of the sea as Bekiyat Yamsuf. Instead, we refer to, as, to it as Kriyat Yamsuf. Well, what's the difference between Bekiya and Kriya? Well, the first time we see that the word Bekiya is mentioned in the Torah itself is during the episode of Akedat Yitzchak, of the binding of Yitzchak. In those passages of the Torah, we read how Avraham, Avinu, alav shalom, was Bokeya, how he was breaking apart the wood that he was going to use for the fire around the Mizbeach, around the altar. So the word Bekiya, as it first appears in the Torah, means to break something. But the word kiriya literally means to tear or rip something apart. So why the difference in terms? Listen to the amazing chidush. Listen to the amazing message of the Ger Rebbe. He says that Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu to put his holy staff, his mate down, so as not to split the sea with the staff. So how did Moshe split the sea? The Pasuk in Sefer Shemot tells us, Vayet Moshe et yado al hamayim, and Moshe stretched forth his hand upon the waters, Vayivaku hamayim, and the waters split. Moshe was commanded to stretch forth his hand over the sea, and Vayivaku hamayim. The sea splits. At that moment, the ocean becomes divided. 
at that moment it was indeed a Bekiat Yamsuf. As we see the Pasuk states, it was as if Moshe Rabbeinu put his hand down upon the sea and broke the waters open. But that this was, by the way, moments before, uh, moments after Nachshon ben Aminadav, Alav Shalom, jumped into those waters to demonstrate his faith in Hashem. And the waters did indeed break, Vayivaku. But the Ger Rebbe says that the waters didn't part completely. So now I want you to picture the scene, if you will, and try to envision yourself there in this great moment in history. Imagine standing there at the sea, together with millions of your Jewish fellow brothers and sisters. The sea is raging. Behind you are thunderous sounds of the Egyptian chariots making their way in your direction. Then you hear Moshe Rabbeinu declaring, Al tirau, do not be afraid. Hityatsevu, stand firm. Ureu et Yeshuat Hashem, and see the salvation of God that He will create for you today. All you have to do is march forward. This is God's instruction. You're afraid. But suddenly, you see Nachshon ben Aminadav running into the sea. Unexpectedly and amazingly, you see that the sea breaks open. But only to a certain extent. You see that this is a bikia. You witness the sea breaking apart just a little bit. And then you notice that Moshe Rabbeinu and your fellow brothers and sisters begin to take steps into that small opening of the sea. You witness the faith and the trust that they possess in those moments and you suddenly feel inspired. And together with them, you, you enter into a semi-broken sea with great trust that Hashem is with you. And now, as you and the entire nation are taking one step after another into the broken sea, the waters rip and tear open more and more in front of you as you proceed one more step at a time. Imagine how much faith and trust Am Yisrael displayed that enabled the sea to be nikra, to enable the sea to rip apart as they progressed further and deeper into it. You know what that means? It means that in the very beginning, HaKadosh Baruch Hu was the one who indeed was Bokeya the Yam. He was the one who broke the sea open just enough for the people to demonstrate their faith in Him. But the Jewish people were the ones who were Korea the Yam. Through the tremendous faith and trust that they displayed, Am Yisrael were the ones who tore the sea apart with every step of emuna and bitachon that they took as they marched slowly into those waters. With every step forward into a world of complete faith and trust in Hashem, they saw the sea parting a little bit at a time until they managed to split the entire sea into a shoehorse formation. We actually came out on the same side that we entered. And when the Egyptians arrived at the middle of that U-shaped opening, at that moment of God's glory, Hashem brought those waters back down on our enemies. That's why the episode of Kriyat Yamsuf 
is the place of faith that we have to go to. That's our go-to place when we are tested in life. Kriyat Yamsuf is the answer of how a Jew can create miracles that no man has ever seen through his faith and through his trust in Hashem. Every step we took then was with firm emunah and bitachon in Hashem and relying only on Him. And they were not easy steps to take. They were very heavy duty steps, but they were made with tremendous faith and trust in the Boe Olam, in the creator of this world. And with that faith and trust, we were able to rip and tear the ocean apart as we walked into that seabed. The more faith and trust we displayed, the more the ocean split until the entire sea was completely divided. That's why we refer to this episode as Kriyat Yamsuf, because we were Korea the Yam. We were able to tear the sea apart with our footsteps of faith. That's the amazing Chidush of the Ger Rebbe. And what it teaches us is that many miracles are based on our actions. We have the ability through faith-based actions to create miracles as grand as the splitting of the sea. HaKadosh Baruch Hu can produce any miracles that He wishes for us. He is a Kol Yachol. He can do anything and everything. But He wants to see us jumping into a raging sea with faith and trust first. He wants to witness our emuna and bitachon in those critical moments. And once he sees us jumping into the waters, as difficult as that may be, when he sees how we're willing to accept the nisyonot, the challenges of life, when he witnesses how we are mityatzvim, how we stand firm with faith, how we're ready to overcome our greatest fears and to rely only on Him. When He sees that we are ready to be led into a world of salvation, even when we think that we may drown in our challenges, that's when He will be bokeah et hayam. That's when He'll break the sea of life open just a little bit for us to gather the strength to forge through with great faith and trust and be korea the yam and rip the sea apart completely. That's when He'll offer us the opportunity to be, to have a kriyat yamsuf, to split the sea of life and walk safely through to the other side unblemished, unharmed, and with renewed hope. That's the lesson of Kriyat Yamsuf. That's the message of the splitting of the sea. There's a famous story of a, of a town where the majority of the people were farmers. Obviously the town relied on God to bring down the rain for their daily sustenance. That year, however, there was a terrible drought and no rain fell upon the land. And the people didn't know what to do. What was going to happen? How are they going to survive? When there's no rain, the crops don't grow. So they approached the town rabbi to ask him for advice. And the rabbi opened up the Gemara of Ta'anit and he said, Do you know what a Jew does in times of a drought? He showed them the words of the Chachamim and the Gemara and they all decided that the following day they are going to gather together to pray the entire day with great fervor. It's going to be like a Yom Kippurim. So they set aside their entire day, they closed their businesses, and they put away their busy life schedules to gather together in the town square. Thousands of men, women, and children came together to Davin. Every person came holding a Sefer Teilim, ready to begin praying. But interestingly, the one person who wasn't there was the rabbi himself. And everyone wondered, well, where's the rabbi? But he's the one who told us to come together uh, to pray, and he's not even here. After waiting a very long time, all of a sudden the, the door of the rabbi's house opened, and he came out. He made his way through the crowd, and he stepped on the small stage that they had prepared for him. Everyone was waiting for him to say a few words of inspiration so that they can finally begin to pray. The rabbi opened the Sefer Teilim, 
as everybody stood there wondering when they're going to start the tefillot. So the Gabbai, the rabbi's assistant, turned to him and he said, uh, Kvod Rav, can we begin now? And the Rav said, no, not yet. So the Gabbai said, but, 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 but Rav, the people have been waiting for so long. I, I really think we should start to daven already. And the rabbi said, no, not yet. And then the gabbai noticed how the rav was looking out into the crowd at the masses of people who gathered there, and he was analyzing the people, scanning the crowd. So he asked the rav, rabbi, what are you looking for? Don't worry, everybody's here, we're all waiting for you. Let's begin the prayers. And the rabbi said, no. He cleared his throat ready to speak as the people remained silent anxiously awaiting his words. He banged on the shtender and he said thousands of you came out of your homes today and stopped everything in your life in order to gather together to pray to Hashem that he should send us some rain and not a single person here brought an umbrella. Many of us possess the talk of emunah. We know how to speak about faith. But how many of us are filled with genuine bitachon? How many people have the trust needed in Hashem's miracles? Do we believe with complete faith that everything that happens in this world is truly by God's design? Do we have enough trust in Hashem to know that He's the one who decides if a missile will land in a certain part of the world or if that place will be spared? Do we understand that He's the one guiding and maneuvering history and the leaders of the world and the decisions that they're going to make in order to fulfill His ratzon, His will? Do we have enough emunah in Hashem to realize that He's deciding which leaders will rise to greatness and who will fall? Which of them will have political conflict and which ones will have momentary pause? Hashem is the decider of all and of everything. He's the one in control of global events of governmental sh struggles and how long the tension in politics will last. But do we really believe that? Did we believe that God was the one handling the events of the coronavirus and that he's the one who brought the entire world to a halt? And he did that in a matter of a few days? And he also did that in order to show us that no one else is in control in this world other than him. He did it to demonstrate to those who felt safe and secure and good under the leadership of Trump that even Trump cannot prevent or save people from a worldwide pandemic that was created by God himself. He was trying to teach us, Hashem, to stop having faith in people and in governments. He brought the entire world to its knees, including Trump and all his followers, and all those who were so certain that he'd win a second term and that all would be well. But he wasn't chosen a second term. There are times that Hashem forces us to see the reality so that we could wake up from the fantasies that we create in our minds. That's the only way to free us from the galut that we're trapped in. There are times we don't know, we don't see or fully understand what is good for us because we are so steeped in an exile mentality. And that's when Hashem has to force us for our own benefit to see and to experience His emet, His truth, in order to shake us out of our dreamlike state. And now, just two years after the coronavirus, it appears as if Hashem is once again forcing us into a situation where we'll be prompted to do tshuva, to repent.
and he's doing it because he wants to bring the Geula. He wants to redeem us and he wants to send the Mashiach. It's as if Hashem says, my dear children, I've given you so many warnings, so many indications that the end is drawing near. I have offered you so much time and many opportunities to repent and to do my will. I sent you a number of serious events in order for you to know that the time has come for you to leave the Galut. But I think it's enough already. If you haven't yet understood the message, or if you have understood the message but you choose to interpret it to fit into your own life narrative, if you haven't yet repented when the whole world is so desperately seeking a redemption, if you will refuse to leave the galut that you seem to love so much, I am going to have to force you to do so because I want to bring the geula already. And I also want you to be counted among those who partake in it. And I want you to partake in it because I love you. And I want only what's best for you. I want you to come home already. I want you to repent. What more can I do to convince you to do tshuva and to come home? So once again, we're in a situation like Matan Torah, where Hashem, remember, held the mountain over our heads, Bal Kochechem, to force us to accept the Torah Shebe'al Peh, to force us to accept the oral law. And we're once again in a time in history where Hashem feels He has no other choice but to force us into doing tshuva so that we could merit to be redeemed. We are at a very pivotal time in the history of the world. The geula is imminent. But we need a serious demonstration of tshuva and of a genuine yearning to return to the land that was promised to us. We need a national show of faith and trust. We need a global movement of tshuva. We need a modern day reenactment of Kriyat Yamsuf. Somebody's got to jump into those raging waters. The question is, what brings about a Kriyat Yamsuf, a splitting of the sea? Chachamim tell us that it's the emunah and bitachon of a Jew and how he's actively demonstrating it in his life. It's not enough to daven, to pray. The question is, did you bring an umbrella? Are your actions equal to your words? Are you really and actively displaying your emunah and your bitachon in Hashem? That's the test and the question of Kriyat Yamsuf. So in life, it's not enough just to show up. You have to show up with your umbrella. You have to demonstrate that your emuna is genuine. On the Seder night, tomorrow, and throughout the seven days of Pesach, as well as the remainder of the month of Nisan, we have to be filled with actions of faith and trust. We have to demonstrate that we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is with us. That, that although we might be sandwiched in between the sea and the enemy behind us, so to speak, we believe that Hashem will split the sea for us. Hashem is a merciful God. And many times He does things that appear questionable to us, even though it's for our best. It's really a chesed. It's a merciful act on His part. When the coronavirus struck a few years ago, and they notified Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Alava Shalom, about it. You know that he was not afraid. He just kept repeating the words, Hatzala, Hatzala, Hatzala. This is our saving grace, this virus. This pandemic was created, he said, to help us draw closer to Hashem and to inspire us to do tshuva. That's what he was telling people. And even recently, when Eretz Yisrael, was attacked on October 7th in the most brutal and vicious way. That horrific tragedy brought out so much good among our people. So many hearts were opened to help us here. Not to mention the amount of chasadim, all the kindnesses that were done globally that was outstanding. 
That was God's mercy shining through, offering us spiritual opportunities. Hashem is the merciful God who wants only the good for the people. That's the quality of a father. There's a beautiful midrash that I want to learn with you today concerning Kriyat Yamsuf, regarding the splitting of the sea and what happened in those moments right before the Egyptians drowned. And with this we will conclude. This is, by the way, a famous midrash in the al Shimoni. If you want to look it up yourself, it's Resh Mem Aleph. 241, uh, I guess, I don't know, page or chapter of the Yalkut Shemoni that actually highlights the mercy of Hashem in a very, very powerful way. The Midrash states as follows When the moment of truth came and Hashem wanted to drown the Egyptians in the sea, listen to these words. Amad Uza Sar Shel Mitzrayim Ve Amar Lefanav. The ministering angel of Egypt, you know, every country, every nation has its own ministering angel that supervises that nation. So the ministering angel of Egypt, Uza, his name was Uza, stood before Hashem and he said, Ribono Shel Olam, Master of the Universe, Nikreta Tzadik Ve Yashar. You are called righteous and upright. And lefanecha lo avela, velo masopanim, velo mekach shochad. There is no partiality by you or any way to bribe you or dissuade you from the truth of your justice. You are the truthful, just, and righteous judge of the world. And if that's the case, why do you want to drown the Egyptians? Was there ever a time that my sons, the Egyptians, drowned your sons, the Jews, or killed them? Now, if you think about that, this is a big chutzpah, it's a big chutzpah, the part of the ministering angel of Egypt, Oza, because surely he must have heard about the evil decree of Paro commanding that all Jewish baby boys be thrown into the Nile. Didn't he know about the little babies that were placed in the pyramids as bricks? Well, how did Moshe Rabbeinu end up floating in a basket on the Nile? What, what reason would an insane mother have for putting a baby in a basket and then sending it down the Nile River unless she's crazy? What is Uzzah talking about over here? What a chutzpah this is on the part of this angel Uzzah who's trying to defend the Egyptians whom he oversees. Anyway, listen to his brazenness as he continues to speak with Hashem. You want to drown the Egyptians because they enslaved your children? Is that why you want to drown them in the sea? But why? The Jews were already paid for their service. The Jews took all the silver and all the gold for themselves before they left Egypt. They literally walked out of Mitzrayim with all the money of Egypt. So technically Hashem... They were paid for all their years of service. They received reparations for the slavery. Whoa, what a chutzpah this angel is. Wow. He's a wise guy. But what happened after he said these words? Let's see. At that moment, Kines HaKadosh Baruch Hu Kol Pamal Yashel Ma'ala Ve'amar Lahem God gathered together the entire heavenly legion and said to them, I want you all to sit in judgment, be the judges between me and Uzzah, the ministering angel of Egypt. Let us conduct a court case with me as the representative of the Jewish people and Uzzah who represents the Egyptians. Let us see which one of us is guilty and you will be the judges. And then Hashem said, Batchila, in the beginning, 
הבאתי עליהם רעב והעמדתי להם יוסף. In the beginning I brought upon the Egyptians a great famine, but I also brought them the righteous Yosef to be the viceroy of Egypt, and he knew what needed to be done in order to help them. הבין בחוכמתו ונעשו כולם עבדיו. יוסף in his wisdom knew how to salvage the situation and he saved them all. And so I made all the Egyptians to be the servants of this one Jew, Yosef. And indeed, he brought them a salvation. But instead of being grateful to him, what did the Egyptians do? Ulebasof ba'u banai kegerim. In the end, my children came down to Egypt as strangers in their land. Veshibdu bahem shibud kasha. And the Egyptians enslaved them in the most vicious slavery, difficult slavery. And the Egyptians took their master Yosef's children, his family members, and turned them into their slaves. The Egyptians tortured my children. Ad she'alta tsa'akatam lefanai. Until their outcry came before me in the heavens. ושלחתי להם משה ואהרון עבדיי, and I sent them משה and אהרון, my servants. They came before פרעה, and they told him that I commanded that he free my children. And how did פרעה respond? והתחיל מתגאה לפניהם, ואמר, and he began to behave haughtily before them, and he said, מי השם? Who is this God that I should obey and free the slaves? Lo yadati et Hashem. I don't know who this God of yours is. You know what? Hamtinu. Wait here, he tells them. Vaevdok basfarim shali. Let me check my books. Let me check my yellow pages of gods. Im shmo katu vetzli o lo. Let me see if your God's name is actually listed here in my yellow pages or not. Badak. Mockingly, Paro starts to flip through the pages of his books. Velo matza. And he didn't find, Hashem says, he didn't find my name. So Paro said, sorry, your God is not listed here, so no can do. And then Moshe and Aharon answered him, this is the God who created the heavens and the earth. He's the one who takes care of the baby in its mother's womb. He's the one who causes the winds to blow and the rains to fall. He creates the dew and causes the trees and the grass to sprout forth from the ground. He's the one who removes life from a person and restores it at his will. Nefesh kol hai beyado. Every living being is in his hands. At that moment, Paro says Hashem, turn to my servants Moshe and Aharon, and he said, there's no God in this world that can do all the things that you just mentioned. Rather, I am a God, and I created myself as well as the Nile River. Could you believe this heretic Paro? Could you believe his brazenness? Not only was he defying God, he claimed to be a God. Imagine a human being of flesh and blood claiming such an absurdity. We know someone else in history who <coughs> tried to do that, didn't work so well for him. And then, Paro tur turned to his advisors and he said, Shamatem eloka ze ba'olam me'olam? Did you ever hear of such a God as the God of the Jews? I never heard such a thing. And his advisors, who were not as brazen as him, says Hashem. Remember, all this is Hashem talking to the court now, the heavenly court. His advisors said to him, yes, Shamanu, we heard of this God. This is the God of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Paro. We would advise you not to defy the God of the Jews. Don't start up with the God of the Jews. But Paro didn't care. He didn't heed the advice of his own advisors and he said, Lo yadati, sorry, I don't know who this God is. 
And then Hashem tells this summoned heavenly court, Kevan shekafarbi, because Paro denied my existence, shalachti boeser makot, I sent him the ten plagues. But the plagues obviously didn't help him because look down and see how he's chasing after my children in the desert. So not only did he enslave my children, murder their babies and torture them with a gruesome slavery, but after he finally set them free, he changed his mind in a brazen act against me, despite the fact that I demonstrated to him my power and my might. And he chose to chase after my children in order to bring them back to the tortures of slavery. Who would dare to do such a thing and not understand the heavenly message after everything that I put him through? Does he not deserve to drown in the sea, he and his entire army? At that moment, the entire heavenly legion, the heavenly court replied to God saying, Hadin imach. The judgment is with you, Hashem. You have won this court case. The Egyptians are indeed guilty. Uh, and you should do with them as you see fit. At that moment, Uzzah, the ministering angel of Egypt, came forward with an emotional plea, saying, Master of the universe, I know that they're really guilty and they deserve this death sentence as a punishment. But please sit on your throne of mercy when you're judging them and bestow upon them your attribute of Rachamim, of mercy. Have mercy on them, because you are the God of Rachamim. And Hashem sat on His throne of mercy. Before He was sitting on the throne of Din, of judgment, and He went to sit on the throne of mercy. Listen to what happened next. Ba'ota Sha'a at that moment, Ahmad Gavriel, Velakach Malben Sheltit, Veamad Lifrea Kadosh Baruchu. The Archangel Gavriel went down to Egypt and he took a brick out of the wall of one of the pyramids where a little Jewish baby lay dead, cemented inside that brick. He took that brick and stood before Hashem saying, Ribono shel olam, master of the universe. This is the kind of torturous slavery these Egyptians put your children through. Look at what they did to them. They didn't just enslave them. They committed the worst atrocities against your children. Terachem alehem? Would you have mercy on such evil and cruelty? Miyad Chazar Kadosh Baruch Hu, veyashav alehen b'midat hadin. Immediately, God stood up from His throne of mercy and returned to sit on His throne of judgment. Vechazar v'tavam bayam, and He took back His mercy and chose to drown them in the sea. Wow. Did you hear these words? I'm going to repeat them again. Miyad Chazar HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You know what these words mean? It means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu took back His mercy. He retracted His mercy. And then He went to sit on the throne of judgment. But that means that after Uzzah, 
the ministering angel of Egypt asked Hashem to have mercy on the Egyptians even though they were guilty of the worst crimes. Hashem stood up from his throne of judgment and moved to sit on his throne of mercy in order to act with compassion towards the Egyptians. But when he saw the brick with the baby cemented inside, he just couldn't remain seated on his throne of mercy anymore. That cruelty and evil and viciousness just couldn't be overlooked or be responded to with mercy. So Hashem stood up from his Kisei Rahamim, from his throne of mercy, and he went back to sit on his Kisei Hadin, on the throne of judgment. I want to know if you understood what you just heard. Do you comprehend the levels of mercy that Hashem possesses? We, human beings, can never understand. It's beyond human capacity to understand such compassion. God's mercy is unlimited. Even for these vicious Egyptians who, en who enslaved and tortured his children, HaKadosh Baruch Hu was willing to be merciful when someone cried out for his mercy to be enacted. And he would have spared the Egyptians from drowning in the sea had it not been for that brick that he saw that he just could not overlook. Following 210 years of an Egyptian holocaust, Hashem was ready to be merciful to the evil Egyptian oppressors. So do you understand the kind of rachamim, the kind of mercy Hashem would have for me and for you, for his own children? Anytime you think you've committed too many averot, too many sins that God will never forgive, whenever you feel you've descended into a very dark place of life that you can never be redeemed from, should it ever happen that you feel trapped between a raging sea and an enemy behind you, remember Hashem's mercy. Remember that He's your Father and that the mercy He has for Am Yisrael is beyond comprehension. Hashem came down on that day at the sea together with His heavenly legion and He fought against the enemies of the Jewish people. Our Father descended from the heavens to protect His children, to do battle against all those who dared to defy Him and to attack His children. And now again, Hashem has been fighting for us here in Eretz Yisrael like He did at the splitting of the sea and He continues to defend us and to save us from all evil. And we have to believe with perfect and complete faith that He's with us at every turn and at every moment. My dear friends and my dear students, do not be afraid. Gird yourselves with faith and trust in Hashem and in His mercy. Close your eyes. Take Hashem's hand and let Him walk you through the challenges to the other side. It doesn't matter what's going to come next as long as you're relying only on Hashem. Every step we take full of emunah and bitachon can create the most historical miracles as grand as the ones that our forefathers experienced. And with that enormous faith and trust, we will be Korea. We'll be able to rip open the sea and march through it to the era of redemption. I wish you all a Chag Kasher V'Sameach, a holiday full of faith, full of trust, the witnessing of miracles, and may we be Zaycha, 
We should merit to hear Eliyahu Hanavi Zachur Latov announcing that the Geula has finally arrived and that Am Yisrael and the entire world is going to be redeemed. Amen, Ken. Yehi Ratzon. Thank you.